the way of the world, the familiar, the routine, drifting toward the same ends, heading off in the distance, as if there was no other way. But when you meet Christ, you realize there's a different direction, a guide that invites you on a counter-cultural pilgrimage. You find a sweet harmony in conversation, in step with him. You realize the blessing that it is to be near to him. He asks you to drop everything, to follow the path toward him. And while the walk is certainly not without its challenges, you are not left unattended. But it's easy to lose focus. It may not be intentional, but if you're not disciplined to move, the gap can widen and you'll become used to your callousness. He desires to have you close and you remember how pleasing it is. But the affairs of the world can become rather overwhelming and there are times when you feel trapped, times when you get preoccupied, distracted, pushed, pulled, bogged down and you realize the instant that you're not actively moving toward him, you're moving away from him. Remember who called you to this journey and run to him. It is good to see each and every one of you here today. I don't know about you, but I love a good video that has a great message like you just saw. Um, one of my favorite lines, if not my favorite line from that video, I had it put on the screen. That's not it. Well, I don't know what to say until it comes up. It's okay. Um, I'm going to, I, I don't know what I'm going to say, so I'm just going to wing it. Um, today we're starting a new study um, on the book of James. And um, yeah, there it is. It's called A Faith That Works. One of the greatest frustrations I have in life, I don't know if you're anything like me, but is whenever you have something, a car, a computer, a phone, that does not work. I like things that work, don't you? Well, faith can certainly be like that, a faith that works. Here is the quote that, um, from the video. And you realize the instant you are not actively moving toward him, you are moving away from him. Remember who called you to this journey and run to him. I love that quote from that video. Like I said, awkwardly, just a few moments ago, we're starting a new study on the book of James entitled A Faith That Works. We are closing the chapter of a series that we actually ended two weeks ago entitled Up Close and Personal, where people's lives throughout the Gospels were changed forever because they encounter Christ. And I hope we go back to that series because I think anytime we can look at the Gospels and we can look at Jesus, how could you go wrong? I became a Christian. I accepted Christ when I was 16 years old. And um, I began to follow him. I had never really read the Bible before. I remember talking to somebody that was older and much wiser than I, and I said, where do I start? And he suggested I read the book of Jeremiah. Okay, have you read the book of Jeremiah? Okay, so I read the book of Jeremiah. I go to counseling because I read the book of Jeremiah, and then I realized something that I probably should not have started in the book of Jeremiah. He, he's, he's called the weeping prophet, just in case you did not know. It's pretty intense. 
And then I realized as I was directed and I grew that um, I was pointed to the Gospels. And over the years working with students, there are a couple um, of things I highly recommend if they're not familiar with reading the Bible, with reading the Word of God, is to to get to know the author, get to know the genuine article, read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the Synoptic Gospels, which simply means same. And then John is probably my favorite Gospel because it's just so different, because I realize I am so different. But you know what? John is what I love, but the, the second book that I highly recommend people look at is the book of James, because it's just packed. It's packed with practical Christian living. How do I live this out? There's so many great books. But today, we get to turn to the book of James. I don't know when you realize this or learn this, but I've told students over the years to look for a couple um, key things whenever you read the Bible. And this is it. Who, what, where, when, and why. Maybe if you and I do the same whenever we approach Scripture, it will become even more alive. And today, just for a moment, we're going to look at James chapter 1, verse 1. And it's going to answer some of those key things that I just mentioned. Who, what, where, when, and why. James. Now, there are four Jameses in um, the New Testament. Um, we know one did not author it because he died before it came out. So that's just pretty much impossible. It was about 20 years prior to um, the writing of James. So we know that the brother of John did not write it. He was martyred before the authorship. There were two other James. We'd know that um, it wasn't from them. They weren't prominent people in the early church. But then there was James the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus. Turn, if you would, as we get to know this guy a little bit more, to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. After this, Jesus went around in Galilee. He did not want to go about in Judea because the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near... Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave Galilee and go to Judea, so that your disciples may, there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe him. Brothers, um, here in verse 3 and verse 5 in the Greek, refers to flesh-born relative. Now turn, if you would, over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you. This is Paul, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then He appeared to James, and then to the other apostles. That is James. You know, he became a follower of Jesus, but it wasn't until the resurrection. The resurrection changed everything for Jesus' half-brother. The resurrection changes everything for you and I. He became a leader in the early church. We know this, and he presided over the early church. If you read Acts chapter 15, you know that there was a council at Jerusalem, and there was a big... Um, to do about um, discussion about what um, um, things in the law, people as they came to faith in Christ were going to have to do. For example, in Acts chapter 15, we know they were talking about circumcision. Should we expect these people that are coming to Christ to be circumcised? Paul was there, um, Barnabas was there, Peter was there. It was a big to do in Jerusalem. And then I think it's about verse 13, someone speaks up. Who is that that is basically um, exerting leadership in the early church? It's James. It's James. 
James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. James was not only the half-brother of Jesus, he calls himself a servant. I love that. You know, if I was Jesus' half-brother, I probably would have thrown that around. You know, you better recognize, because Jesus was my brother, but not him. James said, a servant. Tradition says that he died around 62 AD. He was martyred. He was beaten and thrown down from the temple and his body was picked up in pieces. James, a servant. The word literally means it's doulos, which means a bond slave. A person who has no rights. A person without normal freedom. And this word brings with it the meaning that this person would be totally sold out to your master, who just happens to be your brother. It means this, we are not our own. It says this, you, Lord, call the shots in my life, where you and I would choose, just as he did, to abdicate the throne of our life. That's James. Abdicate the throne of your life. That is not seen very much in our culture today, is it? To say, you are in charge. No, the world tells you and I, you call the shots. You are A number one. You're king. James didn't say that. Jesus is king. When it comes to a slave, Everybody who read this would have known exactly what he was talking about. Half of the Roman Empire were slaves. They would have known what a servant was. Sixty million people were slaves. And the wealthiest of the Romans would have as many as 20,000 slaves. And then James says he is a servant. There is this thing that I think you and I need to key into, and it's called biblical servanthood, where you and I don't look for rewards when we do something. You do what a slave is supposed to do. We serve the master. I've been a little disillusioned, to be honest with you, at times, um, being around other people in ministry, and here's why. Because you and I can't help but read the scriptures and know the great importance of humility. And sometimes in ministry, even in ministry, I've seen um, an air of arrogance. And that is not what you and I are called to. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. John 13, one of my favorite passages. And I think it's John 13, about verse 15, Jesus says, you know what, you should do as I have done for you. I have set the example. To the 12 tribes scattered. We know this is primarily written to Jews who have been dispersed amidst incredible persecution by the Roman Empire. Going back to what I awkwardly said at the start, the book of James is so practical. And how many of us in here need practical Christian living? Need to know how to do this and how to live this out. I believe people are hungry for it. I've got an email that's buried from several years ago. And um, a friend of mine that is just, was desperate at the moment, as so many of us are, so many moments, for how do I live this faith out? I put this on the screen. Life is hard enough. Life without Christ is even harder. How do I make this marriage work? How do I survive as a single parent? How in the world does anybody parent a teenager? Hypothetically speaking, of course. How do I remain a follower of Christ at my work? 
when it's so hard. See, there's a theme of chapter one is trials and temptation. And I want us to look at how in the world can we have victory in the midst of trials? How can we live victoriously? How can we have a faith that works? If we do that, I think we need to remember a couple things. But first, would you read verses 2 through 12 with me? I have to tell you before I start reading, God has been rocking my world with this um, passage <laughs> and this message today. Perhaps I'll tell you why later on. It's been a wild week. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those that love him. How in the world can you and I live victoriously? How can you and I have a faith that works? There are a couple things I think that are very apparent from this passage. Here's the first one. Remember this. God has a plan even in difficulty and suffering. God has a plan for you and I even in the midst of difficulty and suffering. The testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. You know what that means, right? There is dare I say, value in affliction? That's tough, isn't it? It's easy to say, it's kind of hard to swallow. But you and I probably need to expect trials in our life. As a matter of fact, and I hadn't planned on saying this, I'm going to just kind of wing this, but I was told one time, maybe it was in Bible college, maybe it was after, maybe it was in a sermon, but if you're not going through some difficulty or having experienced some difficulty and Satan's not taking some jabs at you, you better look at your life. You better look at your life. Don't buy into, oh, just think positive or if I follow Jesus, it's all going to be good. Wouldn't that be nice? Whenever you face trials. The Bible does not say if Ever you face trials, but whenever you face trials. See, God is interested not only in our salvation, but in our sanctifi sanctification. That means being set apart. Set apart. Perhaps you and I need to realize when we're going through difficulty and difficult situations, we're being made into the likeness of Jesus. It is a process. There might be instant hair growth formula, but there is no spiritual growth formula that is instant. We are called to count it all joy. That does not mean that we enjoy the moment. We don't, do we? I don't. But what he means is this, that God has a plan and the end result, it will be worth it all. Rejoice at the end product. That's why here, right now, at this church, in this church family, we will not wear a mask. 
We're not going to put on a mask that, um, that shows fake joy. And all is good. It's all good all the time. A lot of churches have adopted this philosophy and said this. It's okay to not be okay. We're real here. But for the follower of Jesus, we can have hope even in the midst of trials. You need to know that. I need to know that. Perhaps God wants to bring you and I from a wimpy Christian to one that overcomes. One that we will stick out the commitments we make to God and we make to one another. Perseverance perhaps comes through suffering. Maybe you and I need to go through this basic training. And for some, from my perspective, it seems entirely too long. You've heard this saying probably, trials will make you better or they will make you bitter. It's true. May our prayer be, Lord, make me stronger. See, God wants to mature you. God wants to mature me. Sometimes it's not that pleasant. But perhaps you and I don't win unless we sweat. See, you don't run a marathon right away, I suppose. And the Christian life is not a marathon, is it? Or not a sprint, rather. It's a marathon where we must endure. This passage, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 10, I have it put up on the screen. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. Perseverance comes through suffering and trials. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, this is not going to be on the screen, but talks about not remaining an, an infant spiritually. And this is what it says. Grow up in your salvation. There is this thing about maturity. And my concern is in so many churches, so many times, all too often, there are people that have been adults a long time, but spiritually they're still in infancy. We have got to grow up. So, I have a question for you today. What do you do when you're going through a trial? What do you do? How do you respond? The Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 5, to ask God for wisdom. Ask God for wisdom. Now, at first, that seems a little strange to me. It seems a little out of place, but you know what it means? Don't waste the opportunity in front of you. Don't waste the opportunity in front of you. And let's be honest, God doesn't always deliver us from trials before us, does he? He doesn't. I love the conversation about um, the rich and poor. If that is confusing to you, it means we're all on the same level. The rich go through hard times, the poor go through hard times and everyone in between. The trials hit us regardless. And I am inspired by people who are going through a difficult time, whether it's in the hospital or wherever it might be. And they have this resolve that no matter what comes my way, God's got this. Doesn't that inspire you? See, God has a plan even in suffering, but let's don't end there. The second thing I want you to remember is this. God has a prize at the end. Stand firm. 
Verse 12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those that love him. See, trials help our perspective. I know that's not easy to hear. But I have a challenge for you today. For each and every person of every age in this room right now, and perhaps might be watching this later, Face trials with the perspective of eternity. Face trials with the perspective of eternity. There are people I know, there are people you know that are going through difficulty and are going through very, very tough times. And I tell you, as I think of um, some just inspirational people, I'll probably mention them at the end. Um, man. They're facing trials with the perspective of God's got this and e eternal reward. And there's a prize at the end. See, God wants to mature us. And one of the most common ways to develop endurance is what? Training. Training. This is um, ugh, not the easiest thing. Endure literally means it's an athletic term. And I want to share with you a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. It'll be on the screen as well. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Is there a second slide to that? Thank you. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. See, we have this visual of um, a runner who endures strict training and discipline. Training will help you. Well, you probably surmised I'm not a runner. I don't know anything about that. But I have a friend who is. I'm here with my good friend Brian Mitchell, who is a runner. And I, I want you to tell me a little bit about um, being a runner, what that's like. Being a runner, runner in the very beginning is uh, difficult. When you first start out, you start out slow and you just want to give up, but you just keep remembering your goals and you just want to, you want to reach it and you just push through. There's a lot of pain in the beginning and ibuprofen is your best friend. <laughs> now, um, how important has it been to have other people encourage you and to support you through this running habit of yours? It, you <laughs> it is a habit, yeah. it really is. Um, when I first started out, I had my wife, Jennifer, and my best friend, Justin, with me, and if it wasn't for them, I would have given up. They pushed me to go faster and be better, and it, it just gave me the strength to push on. That's awesome. And that's kind of like that in the church, too, Brian. We need one another to encourage one another all the more, you know, and the scripture definitely talks about that. So right now, you run marathons, right? Yes. So did you just start off one day by running a marathon? No. Okay, not at all. Okay, not at all. I'm not a runner, I, so I don't know these things. I first started out, uh, I built up to a 5K, and that's three miles. And then um, I worked my way into a 10K at 7.6, and then uh, Jennifer and I ran a half marathon together. And then when I got done with that, I felt like, ah, I got a little more in me. Who's faster? You're going to go for a full marathon. Don't answer that question, sorry. Um, anyway, so full marathon. So right now, you, you can run a full marathon, and at one time you were like, how far could you run? Like yes. a quarter mile, uh, half quarter mile? Quarter of a mile. When I first started, maybe I could get a quarter in. And yeah, now I can run a full marathon, and I, I definitely get a half. Okay, so James chapter one, um, verses one through 12 is what we're talking about today, Brian. And it talks about definitely uh, perseverance and endurance. What would you want to say to people that want to run and definitely how that relates to the Christian mm. life? Running definitely takes endurance and perseverance. You have to push through. You have to keep telling yourself, keep going, keep going. And you need friends and you need support around you. And in the Christian life, it's the same way. You need friends, you need family to come around you and guide you and support you. You need uh, people to help you to uh, read your Bible, to be there to encourage you. 
to just push through. Yes. Okay. Thanks, Brian. See, you and I don't run a marathon right away, but we don't endure for an earthly reward, do we? We endure for a reward that will never be taken away. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store it for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and with these um, break in and steal, but store it for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and th where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I kind of quoted that in, from memorization from a different translation, but it means the same. That's an investment that you and I can bank on. There's a phrase, never waste your pain. And many Christ followers then and now have lost jobs, homes, families, possessions, their lives. And I can't help but ask myself, what am I willing to lose for the cause of Christ? For each one of you, every single one of you that has accepted Christ and is trying your best to follow Him, we need to memorize, we need to have this in our hearts, in our minds, as I read it from this page. It will be worth it. There's a book that I was challenged to read, and if you struggle with this, or have struggled, or know somebody who's struggling, I would encourage you to read it. It's won all sorts of awards. It's a book by Philip Yancey, and it's, it's man, it's good. Where is God when it hurts, is the title. Where is God when it hurts? One of the best on, where is God in the midst of this suffering and difficulty? One of the best I've ever read. See how God works in the midst of suffering. I love the words of Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus said this, in this world, you will have trouble. Isn't that encouraging? But let's don't stop there. You know what he says right after that? But take heart. And in my Bible, there's an exclamation mark. I have overcome the world. And the encouraging thing for you and I is we too can overcome the world through him. Paul's famous last words as he was in prison. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I believe that. In the video, there was another phrase, another line, and it says this, you have been invited on a counter-cultural pilgrimage. And I believe that for you and I. See, if you and I can keep our eyes on Jesus, fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, we can persevere. That is having a faith that works. I'm going to close with a story. I love this story. It's called The Emperor Moth. A man found a cocoon of an emperor moth and took it home so he could watch the moth come out of the cocoon. One day, a small opening appeared. The man sat and watched the moth for several hours as it struggled to force its body through that little hole. Then it seemed to stop making any progress. To the man, it appeared as if the moth had gotten as far as it could in breaking out of the cocoon and was stuck. Out of kindness, the man decided to help the moth. He took a pair of scissors and snipped off the remaining bit of the cocoon so the moth could get out. Soon the moth emerged, but it had a swollen body and small shriveled wings. The man continued to watch the moth, expecting that in time the wings would enlarge and expand to be able to support the body, which would simultaneously, that's a big word that means at the same time, <laughs> contract to its proper size. Neither happened. In fact, that little moth spent the rest of its life crawling around with a swollen body and shriveled wings. It was never able to fly. 
The man in his kindness and haste didn't understand that the restricting cocoon and the struggle required for the moth to get through the tiny opening were God's way of forcing fluid from the body into the wings so that the moth would be ready for flight once it achieved its freedom from the cocoon. Listen to this application point. Just as the moth could only achieve freedom and flight as a result of struggling, we often need to struggle to become all God intends us to be. Would you stand with me, please? My friends, um, the runners, Brian and Jennifer Mitchell will be up here if you want a confidential um, prayer request. I tell you, I've known the Mitchells a long time. I love them, and um, they will be glad to come, come around you. That's tough. That message is tough. Probably tough to hear. It's tough to say. Ah, glad I'm through that one. <laughs> um, I am glad that I'm a follower of Jesus and I'm a part of a church family, which means this. I don't have to struggle alone. Aren't you? This life is hard. It is hard. And it means that we get to come together and we can encourage one another all the more. We need one another. Do not forsake the assembling together. Scripture is pretty clear. In a day and time when a lot of people do and a lot of people are, you don't. Because we need Him and we need one another. We don't have to struggle alone. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 says this. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Man. May we carry one another's burdens and be a church family that does just that. If you have a, a prayer request of any kind, we want to pray with you. We want to encourage you. We want to support you. We want to love you. There's no judgment here, and we want to encourage you. Maybe today you're here, and you've never made that first step. You've never invited the grace of God through Christ into your life. We encourage you. Don't let this opportunity pass by. Don't think that tomorrow will, it'll be there then. Every day is a gift, my friends. Every day. And we want to support you and love you. So if you have a prayer request or decision of any kind, won't you come as we sing?